Well, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on this beautiful fall day. I'm Dave Meyer, I'm Dean of the College of Business, and we're honored to uh, sponsor this afternoon's event for our MSU students, our faculty, our staff that can be here, and certainly all the members of the community that join us. Joining me momentarily will be the, one of the newest members of the College of Business, Rob Holt, who many of you know, uh, retired after a long tenure as CEO of Springfield First Community Bank, and joined us as the inaugural executive residence for MSU and the College of Business. In Rob's new role, among other things, he's spending time meeting with classes, student organizations, and individual students to talk about career planning and professional development. Rob also helped organize today's event, so I'm going to invite Rob up and let him tee up our conversation. Uh, I was talking to uh, uh, 
Ken McClure and others yesterday about, I, I wasn't born in Springfield, I was born in Sedalia, Missouri. I moved here when I was two weeks old. And so I, I got here as soon as I could. Um, I grew up here, I went to school, through public schools here. I was able to go to Drew University, and then I went on to Washington University in St. Louis for a master's in healthcare administration. I went to uh, postgraduate work at Baylor in Dallas, and then worked there. I worked at Barnes Jewish uh, Hospital and, then, uh, and at Baylor, and so then came home. This is what I always dreamed, to, to come home. Um, uh, when, I, when I worked in Texas, um, there were 50 hospitals were all competing with full sliver of market share, and it wasn't about the people. And um, I, I can tell you that it's really meaningful to me to work in a, in a town where virtually everyone I love lives, lives in this town. And um, it makes the work uh, more purposeful to us. So my career, I, I, got, I got in the door at Cox. Actually, my first career as a grounds crew member at 15 years old, I, I uh, dreamed of being able to cut the grass. I never made it that far, so I picked up trash and planted flowers. <laughs> and um, then I went on to school and uh, came back uh, uh, now almost 30 years ago um, and have been in various roles inside the system been CEO for now for Very good. Um, so, so tell us a little bit about uh, kind of your leadership style, kind of principles of leadership. And let's talk pre-pandemic, because I think one of the things that we both had to manage through is how the pandemic has changed some of that. Yeah, so it's very different leadership style, I think. I, I think on a, on a spectrum of introvert, extrovert, I'm, I'm in the middle on the introvert side, um, and uh, my management style has been aligned with that. I, I've sort of rationalized that um, a leader doesn't want to stand out and take credit for their team's work. Um, a leader can be low profile. Um, a good leader can uh, be gone for a month and the, and the system works very fine. Um, uh, values do mean a lot to me. My undergraduate, um, I have a political science philosophy uh, degree, and so this sort of sense of values did kind of drive me um, and, and kind of my leadership style. Um, I got away with being this sort of quiet leader, always arguing that, you know, in a crisis, a leader has to stand forward. When I was a kid, there was a, an incident with the Exxon Valdez, a giant oil tanker that crashed off the coast of Alaska, and it spilled oil everywhere. And the CEO didn't even show up to the site. And I remember that vividly, and it was, it was such a big mistake. The CEO should be there. And uh, so I had it back in my mind that, you know, in a crisis, uh, I'll show up, but there won't be a crisis, right? And um, uh, we, we had a 21 month going crisis. So that did change our, like our management approach for sure, being more outgoing, more extroverted. And, and I think in the community, we've all seen that and, and appreciated that. Uh, and it was necessary. I want to talk some more about that. Uh, in a few minutes, but um, uh, maybe a kind of, uh, couple of other preliminary questions. What what would you say, you know, in your 10 years as CEO, again, pre-pandemic, what were some of the ma major things, achievements that you would have been really proud of that you had a major role in? I mean, there, there's a lot of a lot of big achievements that our systems come together as a team. Um, I will tell you that um, one I'm most proud of is in 10 years, we've never had a layoff. And, um, you know, we, we've grown from about 7,000 employees to about 12,500. And um, I know that through growth, um, through attrition and turnover, that um, the savvy leadership team can manage that better. And uh, you know, we did have layoffs during the pandemic that was with support of our board. We were losing a million dollars um, a month, um, a day, um, for a while. And so um, it was costly and expensive, but it, it made a difference. But we've added hospitals, we've, um, we've grown our revenue base, we've, um, been recognized this last year five star in Medicare um, for our managed care plan, and we've um, been a best employer. And that's important to me because ultimately um, it's our job as a leadership team uh, to take care of our employees and take care of our community. And so that recognition, but we've, we've done a lot of neat accomplishments, um, but I think I'm most proud of how we um, try to take care of our employees. Very good. Um, you, you know, I think in, in Springfield we all think about the uh, competition between Cox and Mercy. Um, I'm interested in your take on that and if the pandemic changed that at all. Yeah, so, um, you know, I was, I was brought up um, in, a, in a Cox family. You know, in Springfield, you kind of have a, a Mercy or St. John and, and Cox family, so um, we were trained, you know, it's, it's brand new, it's our competition, right? And, and, you know, we have the same mission, essentially. If you overlapped our missions, um, they would almost be identical, and so really it helps me understand that during the pandemic in particular, we have this unity of purpose. All providers 
came together in ways to support and help each other and the calls to them about, we've got enough vaccine, you need vaccine for your employees, calls about we're changing an important policy. If we change it and you don't, that might undermine your efforts. So we did a lot of communicating, not just with the Mercy, but all, all the providers in the region. And so that did change. And it, I, I think it will forever change my approach to healthcare because in the end, competition does help us strive toward excellence. But we do have a common mission um, in that we want to care for our community. And so um, certainly I want, to, I want to be the best we can be. But I know that we're better because of our competition. And I think they're better because of us. So that, that, that competition makes us better. Very good. Yeah. Very good. All right. Let's, 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 uh, let's jump into the pandemic. Uh, uh, I sometimes say, um, half jokingly, that navigating through a pandemic wasn't on my top thousand things I thought I would have to do as a college president. And so, um, um, was that on your radar at all before January of 2020? No, not, not it wasn't. I mean, we, we had a pandemic 100 years ago, um, and um, I didn't see, think I'd see it in my lifetime now. In hindsight, understanding virology and understanding the risk um, of pandemics now, we, we know that we'll see another pandemic in our lifetime. Um, in my lifetime, I'm getting kind of old. You guys might see several, right? Um, but the world's changing, and the, the risk is higher. But yeah, I, I didn't anticipate um, dealing with it. And you know, we train for crises. We have an instant command team, and it's been generally up and running for 12 to 48 hours. If there's a you know a plane wreck or a tornado. And uh, it's been up and running for 21 months now. And so certainly it's changed our approach um, uh, to leadership. And um, we did not anticipate, I mean, anyone on our team anticipated that. So I remember being in a meeting in about February and someone talking about something happening in China. And, and, and I had no idea what they were talking about. I had to begin thinking about it. When did you first know that this was both real and that it was likely to come to Springfield? Yeah, I mean, great question. I don't think I was ahead of many people. So it was in early January that the World Health Organization said there's a suspicious cluster of pneumonia cases in, a, in the city of Wuhan. And, um, you know, I see China as closed culturally, uh, closed media. Um, we had SARS there before it didn't go anywhere. And so I actually didn't worry at that point. Um, when northern Lombard, when Lombard in northern Italy um, began to see it, um, it spooked us, it spooked me. Um, we brought our incident command team together in February. And so that's when I think we came together. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you just incidentally, um, our very first meeting, so Robin Trotman's our director of infectious disease, Wake Forest, trained infectious disease, he's brilliant, he is tenacious. Um, there's not an article published that's 12 hours old that he's not already read. And in the first day of our, um, that I remember our incident command, he got up there, just filled the knowledge he had, and he said, we're flying blind in backwards. And that, that really spooked me because he doesn't know about it. But we realize that's what a novel virus is and no one knows about it. And so we began to see it revealed. But I, I think that our awareness came um, certainly um, for me when it didn't got hit, not, not different than most people. Okay, so, so uh, uh, take us through then kind of that, uh, that, that first year. Right, so pre-vaccine, um, it's on the radar, you've seen it in Europe. Uh, what do you begin doing and how, how are you navigating the, this critical uh, healthcare institution in our community for that first nine months? Yeah, so I'll we'll have to watch the clock on this because it's hard to boil down that <laughs> nine months or a year. Um, so let me first by saying, um, early influences that helped shape our response. Okay. And two of the most important to me um, are two people I've actually never met personally, and I owe them an enormous debt of gratitude. One was um, a, a nurse named Amaya Dominguez, who is a uh, critical care director at a hospital in Madrid, Spain. The other one is a Dr. John Lynch, um, who is in Kirkland, Washington, infectious disease doctor. So Amaya Dominguez is um, one of our doctors, Jose Dominguez's cousin. Um, she speaks Spanish, uh, not, not very fluent English, and uh, we believe there are crumbs left to um, understand this disease. And if we look forward or outside of our area, we can learn. And so we're trying to gather information from anywhere. And um, 
Dr. Dominguez connected me with his cousin because Madrid was right in the middle of their first surge and, and really one of the few surges in the world. And she would text me back and forth. We could talk. And um, she, um, I, I really became uh, worried about it because she showed me pictures and she had uh, swim goggles hanging up because they didn't have PPE. And her staff had trash bags on. Then N95 masks hanging to dry because they were using them. She said, Steve, we, um, we ran out of oxygen. Um, our, our hospital is using five to 10 times more oxygen than we've ever used. We had to shut the street down in front of the hospital bring giant tanker trucks. And she said, our, our morgues are all full. And so the, uh, the ice skating arena in Madrid had been converted to a giant morgue. That's scary stuff. You are hearing these stories um, on the media but um, it doesn't seem as believable to me because I, I, I really, it doesn't matter what media source, national you know, media, if they have such extreme polarity in the viewpoint that you didn't know who to trust. But when it's someone you know telling you this, that was scary. So that's when we got real aggressive about PPE, knowing that, um, you know, that our employees, our nurses will do about anything for their, their patients if they can be protected. And so, um, to give you perspective, N95 masks, we were probably using 20 to 30 N95 masks a month, and we were projecting to need 1,500 a day. And so the global supply wasn't there. We had emergency cachet, but it wasn't nearly enough. Um, and so we found that our supply chain was broken and even corrupted, you know, price gouging, 20 times the price, et cetera. And so um, she brought awareness to that worry. And then John Lynch, uh, infectious disease doctor, he's at University of Washington, but based in Kirkland. And if you remember in the history, one of the first clusters in the United States was in Kirkland. And it was a nursing home cluster. And one text I got from him uh, late night, he sent us a text like at midnight after his day. And uh, one late night text, he said, seven patients all came at the same time from one nursing home, all coding at the same time. This is unreal. And he gave us advice. Um, CDC was saying, you know, do contact tracing, quarantine, and any employee that's interacted. And he said, look, we, we uh, can't do that because too many employees interact. Our first case um, that we had in Branson was a, a case that converted about two or three days in the state, probably incubated, but that's probably two or three days in, a cardiac case. And we did contact tracing, and that patient had interacted, interacted with 156 employees. So if we start to quarantine every employee, we're out of town. So John Lynch taught us that. He also taught us, um, I think, a real simple way to look at it, the three S's. And we added a fourth S. Um, staff, so focus on your staff. Um, focus on space. So for us, it was like, do we have enough space? Do we have enough ICUs? Um, do we have negative pressure rooms? How do we organize that? And then supplies, of course. And then we added suppression. And, um, and so this is a long question, but I'm going to take a long time to answer. Sure. Uh, so we saw how New York blew up um, overnight, and um, we were worried. And um, we knew that we had to buy time because we weren't prepared. The world wasn't prepared. And so we had to build ICs. We had to gather ventilators. We had to get supplies. There were running out of paralytics in the world. You put a patient on a ventilator, you need paralytics. We're running out of antibiotics. We're running out of all the little parts that support a ventilator, all those things were at, at risk and we need time. And hospitals tend to run full. So we're not built for an extra 187 patients at one time, which is what happened to us. So um, one of the one of the most wonderful things I think, living in Springfield, Missouri, is how our whole community collaborates. And Cliff, you were at those meetings and you were supportive. All the university presidents were supportive of how we work together. And the mayor and the city council, when they decided uh, a very controversial decision, in hindsight, it was the only right decision to slow the city down, um, it bought us time. And in that time, for example, we built a 51-bed ICU. And not only did we build it, but we found out that the contractor, J.D. Dunn and others, agreed to build it without any profit, without any administrative expense. They just paid their staff and paid for supplies. And then Prime Trucking later said, and we'll pay for that. So we built a 51-bed IC. We built it in two weeks, and then it sat um, 
vacant, unoccupied. I did, you had to have equipment, you had to ventilate your quits, get everything going. It was already two weeks. And uh, I, I remember reading, uh, don't ever read social media comments on uh, any of the media stations. <laughs> I love the media stations that more than people would respond could give you um, indigestion. But they, they were criticizing us, like this is the boondog, why did you build it? So we probably had more than 4,000 patients eventually use that ICU. We actually did, added another 30 beds to it, so it ultimately became an 81 bed ICU. It made sense because the ICU was open and there wasn't enough people. So if you're in a normal ICU, every time you go in and out, you gotta take off your PP, but new PP that wasn't enough. This also made it more effective because we only have so many doctors in a crisis, they can take care of many more patients at one time, you know, effectively. So the, the city slowed things down for us. Um, we were able to get supplies. I'm, I see Matt Morrill, you know, if the Chamber of Commerce could support you without that business pressure map, forever indebted for you, all of us working together, I believe, if it hit us as quickly as it hit New York, um, as early as it hit New York, had we not slowed things down, I believe our death count would be tripled. Um, and, and so we all are going to get, you know, some exposures, but we are more prepared and safer for it. So, you know, that's the early part. Um, I, I, I do think over time we, we developed a set, a, set, a set of principles, maybe kind of organically in my head, but I think our team began to adopt those. And I, and I want to mention those because they yeah, please. Really kind of helped us guide our decisions. So, um, you know, the first one was tell the truth. And uh, many of us read this book. I've read three books on viruses and pandemics in March and April of 20, so um, never thought I'd read that much um, on, on viruses. But John Barry, you, this is one book I've gave you. John Barry wrote The Great Influenza, an incredible book um, over the Spanish flu. And if the past can predict the future, this book like, illustrated the future that we were going to see. Almost every move, every societal, cultural issues that happened to us happened back then too. So he said, "Tell the truth," because we lied um, about the pandemic in the great, you know, influenza. The, the whole world was at war. World War One was going on, 1918, and um, that disease had a reverse view. Um, instead of the young and old getting um, higher mortality, it was uh, like 20 year olds. What's unique about 20 year olds, they make great soldiers. And so each country in the war tried to downplay the reality of the Spanish flu. The reason it was probably called the Spanish flu because Spain was not in World War I. So they were free to share the information. And so the world thought it started there, but it was only because it didn't lie. And so we learned that, and, and John Barry afterwards said, millions of lives were lost because we lied. And so we made a principle, we're gonna tell the truth. The truth may look bad, um, it may scare you. Um, we're gonna tell the community we don't have enough PPE, and not a lot of places we wanna admit that. But when we told the community there was not enough PPE, people came to our door in trucks, bringing PPE to us. Um, I, I always wanna give this credit to your colleague, Hal Higdon. Um, he called me one day and said, hey, the, the state has asked us to inventory all of our PPE, and um, uh, so, I think I know what's going on with that. And so before we inventory it um, and report it back, why don't you come up and pick it all up? And that was an incredible, gracious move. And that's what our community did for us. And that support was amazing. So the second one is follow the science. Um, so many decisions we had to make were like, the science isn't there yet. Let's wait for the science. Um, a novel virus, it reveals itself. Um, the science reveals itself gradually. And so we, we follow the science in every decision as best we could. The third one was collaborate with anyone, but rely on no one. And that paid dividends because so many times we had supply chain issues where they say, trust us, it's coming, and we didn't. Or testing, there, you know, there was scarcity of resources. We did not have enough testing equipment, enough ventilators, enough supplies, enough PPE. And so we went outside the normal channels, um, trusting no one um, uh, but ourselves to do it. When we had to do, when testing was scarce, we had to make tough choices on who gets tested early on. And so we decided we're gonna develop our own testing platform. We've gotta have it. Millions of dollars invested. When our, when our doctor said, we need um, a CT inside the COVID ICU, we're like, who else does that? No, why do we need it? Because we cannot move a patient from the fifth floor of the tower who's infectious down all the way to radiology, six floors below, 
um, and without risk in their life, without risk of the infection. So we bought a million dollar CT, and we looked at the return on it. It's the worst business decision I've ever made, and it's one of the ones I'm most proud of. You know, so I think it was the right thing to do. And the last one, um, and it was probably our most important one, is protect our employees. Um, and you know, with equipment, with supplies, with staff, with testing, um, and even later with vaccinations. So those are kind of the guiding principles. We got through January. We had you know the world start getting better, and we, we were beginning to get these things over. Right, April, May looked good, and then um, sewer water testing started to come back. Um, Katie Towns, the health department, was great. And uh, Clay Goddard, of Clay's, was such a great partner as well. And um, and then uh, I don't know the next chapter of Delta life. It is. Yeah. Well, well, before we get to Delta, uh, just a couple of my least favorite words. Uh, <laughs> talk to me a little bit about you know what are your principles following the science. But as you said, the science is developing, right? We heard early on that masks are not effective. And, then, and so how do you manage through a situation where literally every yeah. week, every month, the science is changing, we know more, and so things yeah. change. And in the meantime, people are criticizing yeah. you for yeah. changing, yeah. right? So I mean, I think that's the problem. That, you know, we've never seen science revealed before our eyes. And so, you know, normally we have, um, we have a, you know, a peer-reviewed, published, um, but now we're running on preprints. It's not even peer reviewed yet, but we've got some information that maybe this is helpful and we're desperate, so let's follow it. Um, when people said masking wasn't effective, it's because typically it's not. Um, but what we didn't understand is, is the way this disease spreads, it's not contact, it's very very little evidence of high exposure by touch to surfaces. Um, it's aerosolized, but before Delta, it was really in these encapsulated particles. So even though the virus is small, we found out the mass does slow it down. And so it does help. And really, the world was informed of that because a great coast paper in Springfield, Missouri, published in MMWR, the leading kind of uh, uh, infectious disease CDC, came right out of Springfield. The world was influenced by that. So, um, you know, uh, science was evolving. We were comfortable with it. Our doctors are comfortable with it because we're always learning. Um, and, and that's how science works. But I think that's why it creates such conflict and throw in culture and politics and election year and social media and maybe even outside forces working to disrupt the culture of our country by putting in misinformation through bots and social media. Then we have this kind of cultural war happen. So, 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 that, so the vaccine arrives, right? Uh, uh, December 20, January 21, we start rolling it out and other challenges with that. But to, to many of us, President Trump was one of the first people to get vaccinated, and we think this is this is gonna gonna get it under control. And what yeah, happened? you know, so first off, I'll tell you that um, uh, December twenty first, when we had our first vaccination at the Cox, it happened to be the same day as the Christmas Star, and um, that was really moving to us. You know, and the Christmas Star was at its brightest point it had been. I forget the math now, maybe in a hundred years, and so hugely symbolic to us, and it was a fall down on your knees in gratitude um, towards science, towards your faith, that they came together and we got the solution. Um, you know, I, I'm old enough that I grew up for vaccines or just what you did. We, we have eight vaccines required for our employees right now, always have been, you know, it's not a new thing for us. Um, and so we had this great sense of relief. And then, um, you know, I, so I read, I read a paper um, I think NIH published it, and it was looking at bots from Russia and China influencing our culture. And essentially the conclusion of this paper was the Russian bots are kind of oriented toward general disruption to create kind of chaos in our culture. The Chinese bots were almost uniformly uh, at this time period focused on vaccine hesitancy issues. And about 80% of the bot information was anti-vax, about 15% was neutral, and about 5% positive. Probably the five and 15 were grooming people, bring them on board to the negative. And what shocked me was when I looked at when that paper was published, the data was from 2014 to 2017. So I believe that social media, and the algorithms, and even, even forces at play are undermining us. Um, and then, you know, um, uh, I, I have uh, lost an enormous amount of faith in many, many of our elected officials um, throughout our country. Um, because I think many of them were more concerned 
about advancing their own ambition and their own career than doing a job. And sometimes, I mean, doing your job may mean you don't get reelected. Um, there's a handful of politicians, um, and I don't think I even call them politicians, that I admire deeply, and that's Mayor Ken McClure and our city council members who took all kinds of heat all right, and stepped forward and did the right thing. I'm never grateful for them for that. So I don't know. I think, I think you'll have libraries filled with folks trying to answer this question. Um, I don't know the answer is the fact. Um, we're all, many of us now are trying to, to work through and navigate the vaccine mandates that have come down uh, from the federal government recently. Um, you all decided, uh, as did Mercy, that uh, before there was a mandate that, that you wanted to require your employees to be vaccinated. Tell me kind of the process of how you worked through that, yeah. as well as what success you had. Yeah. So, First of all, you know, th those in healthcare, um, we, we know the history of, of deadly diseases and the power of vaccine, right? Um, I think they've estimated 300 to 500 million people died from smallpox, um, but it doesn't happen anymore um, because of the vaccine. So we, we understand the value of it. It's, it's a miracle of science. Um, we, we did wait for FDA approval. Um, not because we didn't think the evidence was there, but because we thought there was hesitancy, and we thought the timing would probably work out either way, that would probably be the time we would require. We wanted it to happen before the fall. Um, I, re I remember at one point, um, I think in July, during the Delta surge, we had 550 employees out related to extended leave for COVID or COVID quarantine. Um, last I looked, we had 30 out. So if there's an idea of success, um, when we looked at patients in our hospitals, um, the last data I saw, um, I think 91% of our COVID, our recent COVID admissions um, were unvaccinated, and 100% of our ventilated and ICU patients were unvaccinated. So we know the vaccine, it works. If, it, if you still acquire the disease, it does mitigate it. Um, we know the Delta variant um, found ways to navigate um, and probably make some of the vaccine less effective or overall, but still very highly effective against hospitalization. So we made that decision. Um, I mean, I, I, when, I, when I went to, in my inter introduction, I went to WashU and uh, my pediatrician had the time. And um, WashU, it's a medical school campus. They said, oh, we need all your pediatric vaccinations. My pediatrician not only did he retire, but I don't know where all his records went, he couldn't find them. <laughs> so I had to get about 12 shots. Again, I didn't think twice about it. Well, I'm a medical, of course I'm going to do this, because what if I have a disease and carry it? So um, the culture has changed, but in, in healthcare, we decided. Now, we also told people, look, this decision has cultural and geographic differences. So many of our leading positions were like, do it, do it right now. And we'd say, well, here's the problem. If you are in San Francisco, the hesitancy is very low, and you won't have any problems. We're in a red area. And some of the demographics that tend to line up with hesitancy line up in our area. And so um, we run the risk of losing staff. And um, you know that's an ethical decision. Um, and so we had lots of education, lots of incentives. And then finally we said, we're doing it. And we're going to see what happens. We did wait. We thought we had the time to do this. BJC in Missouri um, had the first deadline. And uh, that's St. Louis. We're, we're I know their CEO very well. And so we got daily kind of updates from them, like how it's working. Um, and so we did wait to see a couple other places go first. Um, we know St. Louis culture is a little different, but Springfield probably less hesitancy. Um, when it was all said and done, um, I think we um, were at 99.144% compliance. Um, we did <coughs> allow accommodations for med some medical and some religious exemptions, but in the end, we moved from about 75% to about 99%, and that's a good message. And, and honestly, I, I had some people say, I don't believe in a culture that requires vaccines, and, and I get it, um, but that's not our culture. The culture in our healthcare is the patient comes to our hospital, they should not feel that they can be at risk of acquiring a deadly disease that, you know, because they're for heart attack or they're in for another thing. So we, we feel like we have to protect them. So, um, it's gone, it's gone better than we anticipated, honestly. 
Um, we did lose some employees. Um, we, we, um, we did increase our entry level wages to $15.25 an hour, and we've been hiring about 100 people a week, and they all know about our policy, so every time we lose someone, we're, we're getting someone that is more aligned with our culture. We decided you don't make decisions for what it's going to look like next month. You make decisions for how your culture is going to be in five or 10 years. We think our culture will be better, and so that's kind of our story of, of the vaccine. Any sense of why Springfield seems to be at the cutting edge, the epicenter of the Delta variant in July and August, right at the school? Yeah, you know, um, so, you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, so, so the first round we hit the coast and it came here, and um, which gave us time. Um, it, we were on our heels because we get here first. Um, and, you know, it's how diseases start, you know, that we, we don't know, you know, for sure. But, the, you know, we know that Delta probably had an R naught or transmissibility that might be as high as uh, eight. So that means for every person gets they spread to eight people. And so did we have someone doing missionary work? Did we have someone that took a trip to, to here? Did we have someone, uh, a physician that was from India that came to this? You know, who knows? Um, we don't have any kind of contact trace. I'm looking at Katie. You don't know if you Katie. No, we don't know. <laughs> Um, just like I'm pretty sure when someone asked me, where do you think a particular uh, disease started? And I'll say, here's the one thing I'm pretty sure it's certain of. Wherever we think we, it started, it's probably wrong. And that's sort of how pandemics are. And so I don't know. But, but boy, it hit us first. What's your take on Anthony Fauci? So um, I think in, in Southwest Missouri, people are going to not like my response to this. But um, I, I don't think I heard a statement said at the time that wasn't the best knowledge and best information we had. So I, I think he's done a, a heck of a job. I mean, I can't imagine, I've had death threats. I've had prowlers at my house. I've had, I've been, a, you know, had all kinds of strange things happen. I can't imagine the courage of that man, what he's gone through. Our, our leading, you know, the only thing he probably missed out on is not understanding, um, he understands the bio science, but did he understand the social science? None of us got a social science, right? None of us understand this cultural issue. Um, but I, I actually, um, I, I have a very, our family is very tight. We have a, a, a family member who's a general, and um, you know, his viewpoints um, are a little bit more extreme than mine. And he started talking about Anthony Fauci, and I could hardly finish my dinner. I was like offended by that, because I think that man's a hero, my personal opinion. Good, good. I, I do as well. Uh, you mentioned death threats. I know you were. Costed in a parking lot, going to work at Cox by someone from out of the area who's on the, the fanatical anti vax group. Do you mind talking about that a little bit? How you manage that, and, and what, if anything, you've done to try to keep it from happening again? Yeah. Um, Asking for a friend. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, yeah, I mean, so the you know, backstory is a guy came a thousand miles away. Um, he was invited in this community. There was there's a series of protests that were going on, first at Mercy, and then they were alternating between Mercy and Cox. Um, they, they were generally kind of, you know, almost radicalized people, I think. And this man's history um, was of a person that had committed multiple frauds. Um, he had this kind of wellness sense, but really he had this magic formula that essentially was steroids. And uh, so he's kind of steroided up. He's got mental health challenges, I'm sure. And um, also we found people make a living um, through social media for his thing. So you, you push and post a video, you get 500,000 hits, you get commercials, and so So a lot of people, I don't even really believe what they're saying. This guy did. Um, but, you know, for me, I, I think the only, the thing that made me most nervous was seeing videos afterwards and seeing that he was waiting in the car for me. He knew exactly where I parked. He knew where I, when I went to work. Um, I think it was helpful because I have I've spent 30 plus years in healthcare, and we deal with a lot of people that are suffering, and suffering from mental health. And so, you know, it's hard to look at this person any differently than someone suffering from mental health, and um, try to keep our distance, try to buy time. I, you know, we call it security to come. My assistant, I, I had my phone on recording it, so, you know, if I get abducted, <laughs> there's going to be some evidence, you know, And then we had a lot of young, particularly female employees going into the hospital at that point, and I sure did put them in the hospital, and so, he eventually just went away. And, um, uh, but you know, uh, you know, our physicians tell me that the, the, 
the baseline um, level of psychosis in most communities is one percent. So one percent of the community is suffering, and um, I think in the pandemic that gets ramped up. And so that's just that's really we've got to look at healthcare as the person suffering from mental health. And we try to help those people. You've uh, gotten a lot of well-deserved recognition as a result of the work you've done in the last year and a half. Within um, your organization, um, who are some of the people that you would call out as heroes? I mean, it's, 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 it's so uncomfortable because, um, I mean, I'm not given a single vaccine. I'm not taking a single blood pressure. Um, you know, it's really uncomfortable. <coughs> the, the Casey Stingle quote that um, being a manager is being paid for other people's home runs, and that's, that's my feeling. Um, I'm sitting on the bench, I'm in a tower, I'm not, I'm not at risk. Um, so, I mean, so our incident command team, um, there's probably 30 or 40 core members, and then we've got about 100 people that are participating. Um, Karen Kramer, amazing leader for us, so she essentially runs the Springfield Hospitals. Amanda Hedgepath, um, another uh, amazing leader. Ashley Cassad um, came to us just a month before the pandemic. She came to us from Johnson Hospital, <coughs> amazing. Um, those three women in particular led the way in our response, but our HR team that set up the school, you know, when, when our schools, I think, made the right choice to kind of shut down, 82% of our workforce are women. And we know that women historically take on a bigger burden of childcare for men. And so what that means for a place that's 82% of women is we've got a workforce problem. And so our HR team quickly worked together. We set up a school inside the Myers and had 300 students in it kept our nurses, our team, able to work and feel their kids are in good shape. So uh, our doctor, Dr. Terry Coulter, um, Yale, Cleveland Clinic trained, um, grew up in Rogersville, um, came back to our hometown. Um, he was maybe, maybe the most heroic physician always because he was in the trenches all the time. Respirate therapists don't get enough credit because they were the key to all this. And of course, our COVID nurses were fine as well, aren't they? But it's, it's housekeepers. It's, I don't know if you be excluded from that list of people, except maybe, maybe me. I don't see you personally from it. Um, so, so let's talk about lessons learned overall, uh, including anything that good that came out of this. And I'll circle back around to where we started with, with you personally in terms of your, your own leadership style and how this has impacted you. But let's start with lessons learned. Yeah, so maybe I want to talk about a big like societal lesson. Yeah. Because and there's two. One is really encouraging and one's discouraging. So let me talk about the discouraging one first. And I think this is born out of fear. Um, I believe that we marginalized and minimized humanity during this, and it was devastating. And here's how I think it happened. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a you know middle-aged, Caucasian, mid, living in the Midwest, and there's an episode of disease breakout in China, and I'm not worried because it's not going to affect me. One, I'm not Chinese, and one, it's not my country. And then um, it hits New York. No, at least it, then it hits uh, Lombardi region. And I remember credible newspaper reports. Well, we think the reason it's hit Lombardi region is because, you know, Italians are very affectionate. They touch each other a lot. And they have multi you know, uh, family familiar homes together. And I'm like, why do you think the disease is spread because we're and so, but I'm not Italian, so I'm safe, right? I don't, I don't live in Italy, so I'm safe. Then it hits New York. And they're like, well, it only hit New York because it's an urban area, it's highly concentrated. So out of fear, we continue to say, why am I safe? Because we want to feel safe. So then it hits nursing homes. And then we're like, well, I'm not in a nursing home. And then we start to marginalize it as well. They're old. Um, so their life must be then, um, then we find out that it, um, it disproportionately hits certain minorities, um, African American men, uh, Hispanics. Well, I'm not Hispanic, I'm not African American. So when I think that way, then I marginalize their role further. And then, um, then we find out that um, it disproportionately hits um, people that have obesity. Then I see people comment, well, that's their life choice. So it's, it's their problem. So we now we minimize people for that reason. Then it, it affects people with diabetes more. Well, diabetes is often an acquired disease because of lifestyle, so we marginalize them. It goes all the way down to, to pregnant women, extremely high risk, one of the highest risk groups. And so we began to marginalize, and I just 
I will never understand what goes on in someone's mind when they justify that these lives are okay with us. And so um, I, I remember, I, I'm, a, I'm a recent fan of Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and I think I've read three books about him in the last three months. And you know, he spoke of a man in the arena. Um, and, but in that address, um, he said something that there, there are these people who feel this kind of twist and cynicism. Um, this maybe disbelief in these worthy goals, and um, they're, they don't mind criticizing people for the very thing they would never attend. And so we saw that in our culture. Um, and so now let me think the bigger lesson is that's a small percentage of our culture, the left, a small percentage. But more importantly, people like those in this room, the healthcare workers, put themselves in harm's <coughs> way before we knew how to protect ourselves. They did it anyway. Um, the community leaders that came together, the, the little old ladies that came and dropped off handmade masks for us. Um, you know, so there's a, a, a unifying kind of singularity of purpose that I think our world has seen in this, and that's uplifting. Um, it's uplifting, but I've got to admit, um, it breaks my heart that there is that small percentage of people. But the reality is, is that's society. That, that's the spectrum of society. The people on this side of this room, you're drawn to healthcare often for very deep, powerful reasons, a sense of purpose. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna share kind of a side story. My wife, in the kind of middle of the pandemic, said, Steve, I think you should read this book, The Book of Joy. Yeah, it's, a, it's Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, and I'm like, I have no time to joy. <laughs> <laughs> I am too busy. And, and so she's my wife. So I read the book. I read the first chapter, and I said, yeah, I don't like it. <laughs> um, I disagree with it. And the first chapter kind of said, um, the purpose in life is to find joy. And I thought to myself, life, that seems selfish and hedonistic. missed kind of like that. And she said, keep reading. And so I, I keep reading the rest of the book. It was essentially saying, the purpose of life is to find joy. We find joy in service to others. And that resonates, I bet you it resonates um, for this whole place, but particularly this side of the room. There's something drawing you to healthcare. And I think you, you, you know something a lot of people don't know is joy isn't found in riches, joy is found in service. And um, you're going to be proud of So those, that's another side story, but um, my wife again leads me down the right road um, because I did not have time for joy. So, so you told me earlier, you didn't tell me the story, you told me there's a John Leamy story. There it is. John Leamy's our soccer coach, uh, uh, tremendously successful. Uh, we're hosting the Missouri Valley Conference Tournament Friday. Sunday, right here. Tell, tell me your John yeah, Lamey so story. John Lamey is like a, a um, kind of a, a hero to me. Uh, one, I love what he's done in the soccer program. He's 29 years here and nationally ranked. It's really cool. So when I was young, I had a speech impediment and dyslexia. I was a horrible public speaker. So I made a commitment. If someone asked me to speak, I'm going to speak. Because eventually, maybe I can learn how to speak, right? And so now, all these years later, um, someone asked me to speak at a at Missouri State. It was actually a Sigma Nu event with alumni. It was an, an academic recognition dinner. And um, John Levy and I both were the speakers. He was by far the superior speaker that night. And he told this story that seemed a little, um, oh, you know, uh, Ted Lasso alive. It was real positive, but kind of goofy, you know. That's and John. Is it John? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of wanted to think of it as Ted Lasso. So, that's <laughs> so he told the story of Canadian geese. And as they fly, um, I've heard this story. Yes? Go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to tell you all the truth. Does he tell it all the time? Well, he told it at his retirement party. Oh, he did? Yeah. So he told this to students, and, and I was listening to, so I don't boil it down, but Canadian geese have a flight pattern, and it's by design. It can fly longer and faster because um, they can break the wind. And so when we see those bees, um, that the, the geese behind have less wind, uh, and so less resistance, they can fly longer. But the key is that the leader, that, that lead goose takes the most wind, and it's the hardest part. And so instead of having that goose lead the whole way, they rotate. And so very smart. So that lead goose drops back. So once they've led and they're worn out, they drop back in the safest spot where the west wind resistant. So it made sense. So we're setting up our instant command and um, realizing this isn't going to be for 24 hours. This is going to be for a long time. And so we decided that we're going to have rotating leaders of that because no one can leave that long. And so uh, Karen Kramer, um, who's essentially the president of our Springfield Hospital, was
was the first leader, our number two, Lady Hedgetap, would take her place, and then the number three would take her place, uh, and then they'd rotate back again. And so John Lee, I mean, the, the enduring pressure to lead in this time period was just a perfect analogy because they would have been worn out. And so they protected. So once you left, you went home, you worked from home for a week, and then you got stronger and relaxed, just like that goose sitting there. So great story, and I'm glad it came from this type of stuff. So, so uh, we're going to wrap it up and then open it up for questions. We, we could, the two of us could talk about this and share stories for another three or four hours. Our hour. chairs are far more comfortable. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I was noticing that, 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 that some people are kind of starting to squirm around. Um, um, but let's get back to this. So, so you told us about your leadership style kind of pre-pandemic. How would you describe your leadership style now and how has all yeah. of these events influence that. Well, you know, one I'll say is that I, I learned this lesson, I think, maybe you should just be kind of philosophy later on, is that yeah. um, under stress, our body reacts differently. Um, literally, our brain begins to shut down non-essential functions, fight or flight motion, and, and even our prefrontal cortex um, starts to shut down, and that's where our impulse control and our judgment happens, and so um, I felt that I've got to have these kind of guiding principles personally would be to lead by because you can lose track um, under that pressure and this is certainly a good example. So I, I set um, 10, 10 rules for myself, um, just, just for myself, how I want to lead and um, I, I've been able to lean on those. Um, and they've been true through the pandemic um, but the man who's on the pandemic did change because I knew I had to stand up even though it's not a comfortable place for me to be um, and um, now as I hope we ease um, we're not out of this, but if we ease, you're going to see me ease back in the pandemic. That's my goal. <laughs> and because, you know, if the leader takes too much credit, they're undermining all this, I, I really think very little. Um, I, I had a team making great decisions, and then I got to kind of say, I like it. And, you know, and so we have this great team. And so, um, I, you know, Jack Welch once said, he was a um, former uh, CEO of General Electric, said, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're really bad at hiring people. Yeah. And that's kind of been my philosophy, is hire really, really smart people that um, don't, that are comfortable challenging you. And we got a team that's really comfortable challenging me, so we have to that, it makes us better. I, I completely agree with, with that theory. Uh, and I was actually having a conversation with Senator Blunt uh, two or three months ago, and dragging on some people on his team that had done some really great work for the university. He said, you know, one of the, the most important skill I have is hiring good people. And, and I said, I completely agree with that because I am never the smartest person in the room. And, uh, and that's a good thing. Yes. Um, you, you talked a little bit about kind of as the pandemic eases. So that pull the crystal ball out. Tell us what the world's going to look like in six months and a year. Are, are, are we going back to a pre-pandemic lifestyle or or something close to it? What, what's your sense, Steve? So, so there's a, a immunologist, virologist named Michael Osterholm who um, would say that I'm at the tip of my seat right now. I don't know. I know the past. Um, it's hard to know the future. But I I would forecast. Like right now we're seeing Europe catch fire, especially Eastern Europe. Germany had their highest um, uh, numbers since the pandemic started last week in terms of new cases. So we're not out of this. Um, the good news is that we're vaccinated, the mortality is going down. A lot of people are choosing not to be vaccinated. So, you know, um, it does look like um, the vaccine has some waning effectiveness. Um, it's the nature of a virus to replicate, and they're not great at replicating. So imagine a copy machine that, you know, every time you make a copy of one small, there's, there's a line in it. And generally when a virus replicates, and it does a bad copy, it just dies off. But every once in a while, there's a favorable air, and that favorable air helps it survive, and so it's part of the evolutionary process. So a virus that doesn't want to kill its host, um, it wants to continue on. And, um, and so one thing that often happens, that happened in the Spanish flu, is when these replication errors happen, generally a virus becomes more infectious and less dead. And so that doesn't always happen. So in, you know, in the Spanish flu, we had a, uh, mortality here, the second wave was higher mortality, the third wave was the lowest mortality. By the third wave, everyone thought they figured it out. Like, we've got this in common, it was a different disease, right? 
So we, it's like rolling the dice. If it's a high mortality rate and you roll the dice, it's likely that it's going to aggravate or go back to the meat. And so you're not going to roll snake eyes every time. You're more likely to roll five or seven. So um, I think we'll see this disease um, replicate and make errors again. And let's hope those errors favor us, meaning it's more infectious and less deadly because we, we, we acquire immunity through infection. Um, we've got a lot of people that won't um, get vaccinated. I know the data tells me that there is, um, if you've been infected, you've got a level of protection. If you've been infected and vaccinated, you've got the highest level of protection. And so I don't know what our level of protection is in our community. We've got you know mediocre vaccination rates despite the best efforts, and um, I don't know how many people require the infection and have some immunity, but we also know a variant could change that. So I think we've learned some lessons about masking. It does help. We saw a record low flu, probably Katie in our lifetime. We will never see that low flu again. We're starting to see flu come back. Um, that's kind of a double one because it's hard to manage the boat. Um, I, I have to believe that we've acquired a lot of immunity um, and that we're going to have a, a chop Science tells me that we aren't fighting the same surges as high as we've seen. Um, but you know, again, there could be a new variant that, is, that evades our immune system. So I'm triple vaxxed, even though I'm probably not the highest risk because um, I, I want to I want to keep my mom who's nine years old safe and my family safe. But um, we don't know. If, so it's my host for home wrote another book um, called The Deadliest Enemy. And in that book, each chapter was about the next infectious agent, viral bacteria that could wipe out the world. Every chapter was like this doomsday. But because our earth is changing, because we're deforesting the forest, because animals and people are coming close together, um, the risk of these sort of transfers are more likely. And so I do think that we, we've got risk now in the future. We've got to be prepared. The blessing in this is mRNA. <coughs> the technology is amazing. It's quick. It will save more lives, I think, by, by a factor of 10 or maybe a hundred versus what we've lost in the future. So we've got a new weapon in our arsenal and it's a blessing. And at the same time, medical science is developing treatments so that if, yes. you, if you contract a virus, there are now things that you all can do in right. a hospital right. to help us get well. Yeah, that's a double way. I mean, so you know, we've got moderately effective treatments for, you know, you've got a monoclonal antibodies don't really work when you're really sick. They work when you've got kind of developing illness. They've been helpful, we think. The data looks pretty encouraging on that. But there is new medicine coming up that might be really effective. That combination, I, in the end, I still have faith in science. And I believe science will help us through this. And it will be a combination of, of the vaccines and these antiviral treatments. Because culturally, we're not ready to do the civic thing and get our entire population vaccinated. It's not working in our culture. Not like it did with polio vaccine. 
directly correlate with um, how inclusive we are as other people. So um, that's what universe, it's why, it's why I have a passion at some point in my life to maybe teach a little bit because we kind of get beyond all this, you know, and, and, um, and do that. So you had what, three parts of your question? Can you go, what was your second part? How, how did we address inequities? Basically, how did you address the socioeconomic barriers, yeah. the racial um, access, or racial discrimination, both in the hospital and outside, because yeah. I kind of go hand in hand with the socioeconomic status, yeah. being able to have access at any point, and really the xenophobia of yeah. AAPI communities, right, because right. we saw in March um, yeah. extreme acts of violence against. Yeah. And I know Missouri State made statements about it, but I wouldn't know what to talk about. Yeah, yeah. I made statements about that, too. Um, I have strong feelings about that, and um, so let me, let me, let me so access. We're not perfect, but the, the most important thing we can do as a state um, is to give people better access to insurance. And so Cox Health advocated um, uh, very aggressively toward Medicaid expansion, which will get at least 500,000 more people access to care. So that's the most powerful thing we can do and advocate that we set a polling polling booth inside our hospital um, so that healthcare workers can vote. Um, when it came to the, the pandemic, one of the things we did early on, um, and we had mixed reasons for this, was um, we allowed free telemedicine visits for anyone. Um, we did that because of access issues. We did it because early on we did not want patients going to our ER to get tested and flooding, and so we had that mechanism. So the good news about what the federal government supported with during the pandemic is they treated the uninsured as if they were insured at Medicare rates, and so they had good access. Um, that's going to fade, um, but I'm really grateful um, for Medicaid expansion. Missouri, we were the 38th or 39th state. We weren't the first. We, we were we were turning down billions of federal dollars that our own taxpayers paid into that pool, and we were turning it down. Finally, um, our legislature wouldn't pass it, but finally our people stood up and voted for it. And then our legislature tried to block it again. They went all the way to Supreme Court, and um, I know Missouri Hospital Association. And many of us were involved with help funding the Supreme Court case, and so I'm grateful. But that's the single most important thing we can do is improve access and Medicaid expansion is that big piece of that. And great questions. Good. Others? Go ahead. So I'm a first year nursing student here, um, and I'm curious, you know, as the pandemic progresses, it's likely we'll get to a point where there's a group of vaccinated Americans and unvaccinated, and those unvaccinated Americans just aren't gonna get vaccinated for whatever reasons. If we do get to that point, you know, in terms of ethics, do we decide to keep precautions in place for the sake of those Americans, or do we say, let's open up the country because they had their chance to get vaccinated? Yeah, so I mean, I, my expertise is more in the hospital, so let me first say that um, we treat every patient the same. Um, and, you know, because almost everyone in our hospital um, is there. Um, I can be in our hospital because of lifestyle choices. Maybe I'm not exercising enough, maybe my cholesterol's too high. Um, and so we all make some choices, so we don't want to judge those choices. So if someone has COVID um, and it could have been avoided, we're going to take care of them no matter what. I think society has to be kind of practical, and I think it's a cultural difference. You, you go to San Francisco, you're not getting into a restaurant without showing your card, and they've got a database where you can just scan it. That's not going to happen in the South um, and in red areas, I, I believe. Um, and so there's, it's going to take time. The sad news is I believe ultimately you're either going to be vaccinated or you're going to acquire the infection. Um, and so ultimately it's, it's what it's, how do you want to get it? Do you want to get immunized, immunized and protected from a vaccine or acquire the infection? And unfortunately, so we can get through this, I think. Um, but I, I think Springfield is a great example. We learned that masking makes a difference. And so when the mayor and city council opened the city, I think it's the right thing to do um, because we knew the precautions. They're there. Opening it in March of 20 was, in my mind, not the right thing to do because we didn't know the precautions. But ultimately, society has to keep keep moving on. The, the consequences to an economy that's been stunted has more consequences probably than the disease itself. So I, I think we have to balance that out. Um, but it is an important ethical, ethical question, and I think it will vary through the political geography of our country. Great Thank question. You. Thank you. You know, one of the, one of the important things that I think that Steve talked about was, and just referenced again, was how our community came together to buy time for the hospitals to get ready for this. And I remember being in a meeting with the mayor, the city manager, Clay Goddard, Matt Morrow, and me, and figuring out, they'd already talked to the, to the, the hospital. They are. 
correct? They did. Yeah. And how are we going to move forward? And the, the really encouraging thing for me was, uh, so our two business leaders are mad at me because I'm running a business. And we were all advocating for doing the right thing and supporting the decision the mayor was going to have to make and get criticism for really proud of our community uh, the way we came together uh, on that. And I do think the leadership that our city council, uh, Richard Ollis is with us today, one of our city councilmen have provided on this has been uh, tremendous. They're the only politician I have faith in right now. <laughs> so, you guys want to run for president, you got my back. <laughs> <laughs> Question. Hey, thanks for being here today, guys. Uh, I think unknown question for us is workforce. Um, we're seeing 10,000 uh, people retire um, a day in the United States. Um, the, the baby boomers are, are aging. And um, when they age, um, they're leaving the workforce and they probably use five, 10 times more health care than those under the age of 65. And so it's workforce development. Um, and you, I, I, I love baseball and um, I love the Cardinals. And, um, for many years, they were the best team or one of the best teams in baseball because of their farm system. They developed their talent. Cliff Smart, Hal Higdon, OTC, Jury, Evangel are creating our talent. So that's the first thing is the people in the, in the, in the Bears colors right here are our future. And so workforce is our big challenge. We're doing international recruiting. We've got um, uh, you know, a lot of nurses that are coming from the Philippines and Dubai and other areas that are going to augment us. Um, Cox College itself has doubled the size of their program. Um, that, you know, I tell people that there is no job I can think of, no whole career profession that in virtually any city in the United States that you can have a job for the rest of your life, except for healthcare, except for nurses and respiratory therapists and PAs and doctors. So um, I think that's, that's our biggest worry um, is a diminishing workforce. Um, and the aging of the, of the population. Um, now, another plus side of the pandemic is there's a lot of people that um, are now drawn to healthcare that might not have been drawn because they, they saw the difference healthcare could make. And so I'm actually um, buoyed by this sense that um, of hope that we're going to draw more people into healthcare. Quick. I have two questions, one for Cliff and one for Steve.
So um, in that question, I think, if you boil it down for me, the question is, is how are we responding to <coughs> differences in people's ability to combat disease in the hospital? Is that kind of what you're headed at? Or? No, how do you identify those three groups coming in uh, that basically tells you how you're going to plan the uh, medical or the protocol to fight those diseases because one third of them don't need it. Yeah. So I mean, this may be tangential to that, but if you, I got to meet the founder of 23andMe, um, and, and so she's a biologist actually from Yale, and she's not looking at ancestral.com for genealogy. She's looking at creating a giant database to understand these differences. And so I think there's enormous promise in understanding DNA and the human genome, and uh, we're not there yet. Um, but we know, for example, in this disease and other diseases, there are some of us that are probably invincible and don't know why. And there's other segments that are probably very vulnerable and don't know why. Um, in the Spanish flu, we found um, Inuit uh, Indians, uh, Pacific Islanders, very vulnerable. Um, uh, other races and cultures, less vulnerable. And there's a genetic reason probably to that. Um, but I don't think we have those answers yet, but I think it's around the corner with things like 23andMe that's going to develop a database of maybe 100 million people that can probably tell you if you ate, if you drank six ounces of this particular beverage, your life expectancy is going to be four years lower, you know. And so I, I think there's this real promise in that, but we certainly don't have those answers yet. In, in terms of the, the mental health question, uh, I know it's been, I, I don't want to speak for our students, but I know that for many of our students, it has been challenging attend college during the pandemic, uh, particularly if you started last year and it wasn't anything you'd been hoping or expecting, right? Lots of limitations, lots of modifications, less interactions. Frankly, I've been told harder for people to interact wearing a mask, uh, easier just to sit in class and not say anything, easier not to go to things. For example, we did Typically in recruitment, in sorority recruitment at the beginning of the year, you have 900 young women to go through that this year, 350. Uh, I mean, kind of a pulling back, uh, less less interaction, and so a, a part of a part of that is we have a counseling center that is fully staffed, uh, SGA, all positions filled. We can't say that about most things on campus. All positions filled as of this week. They, they uh, uh, expanded how they interact with folks in terms of group and telemedicine and a whole slew of things. Uh, we surveyed our students every semester over the last three semesters. And, uh, hopefully you all got surveys. And it would, one of the questions typically is, do you need to talk to someone? Call every one of those students. Um, are you struggling with food insecurity? Are you having a hard time navigating your classes on? and try to reach out and then follow up with the appropriate care. I think our faculty have been tremendous, uh, with only a handful of exceptions, to have gone out of their way um, to teach class in multiple ways. Teach class while it's Zooming, while you're in a class, and then, and then record it and let people uh, see it afterwards because, the, because of They've interacted with students. I think they've given students, by and large, multiple chances and opportunities to do things. I, I, my, my experience, and this is borne out by surveys, because typically we've got three to four thousand responses from students singling out one or more faculty members for the work they did to help them through. And so uh, it's not perfect. Um, I'm confident that, that, uh, that there will remain challenges as we move from a pandemic to an endemic and, and we wear masks less often and rules uh, go back to normal as we're able to manage through the virus, I think we'll gradually come back and get through it. But no question, it's
it's been challenging for uh, many of our students. Frankly, it's been challenging for many of our faculty and staff who fear getting the disease, fear giving the disease to their children, their parents, who are worried about being in class with, with 120 students in a marketing class and not knowing who's vaccinated or not. I mean, there's just lots of anxiety at all levels. Um, I will frankly admit to having some bad days uh, over the course of the last year and a half trying to, trying to manage through this. And so, so we, have, uh, we have tried in, in a whole slew of ways to try to help staff and students manage through the pandemic as best we can, including uh, creating a framework that we hope uh, provides people the opportunity to continue their education, because just like we want hospitals to close, we want the universities to close. We think it, it matters what we do, that we continue to turn out healthcare workers and managers and teachers, etc. So, so we knew we had to stay open to do that. We knew there would be consequences of doing that, and so we wanted to do it as safely as we could, but keep going because if students stopped out of college and never came back, then their lives would probably be forever changed and typically the worse. Uh, and so it's been it's been walking a lot, right? Continuing to do things that are really meaningful, uh, trying to modify them and do them in a safe way, trying to support people that struggle with that new way, uh, and trying now to get people that stopped out to come back as we as we get couple more and then we'll be done. Yes, sir. Thank you, Steve, for an excellent presentation. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I'm a retired physician, and uh, let me just say that through observing this uh, pandemic uh, from my perspective as a retired physician, I was overwhelmed by the nursing and physician and administration how they respond to this. A true great demonstration of teamwork that I saw. And uh, it, it helped me understand why you all are doing what you're doing. It's not a job you're going after, it's a calling. And, and you know it, and you show it. And I thought about the, the worst case scenario that I might have experienced if I were in a frontline position in, in, in this pandemic. And of course, the worst case scenario is that, that decision that you might have to make on rationing care. How, can I, do I have a, a ventilator that I can put this patient on? And if I, if I don't, can I take another patient off? Uh, do I have an ICU bed? Uh, terrible, tough, uh, decisions, life and death decisions. Did, did, did cops at the height of the epidemic have to face those kind of rationing decisions? No, but I've seen those stories. Dr. Mahalich, thank you, by the way. And not everyone knows what a difference you made in our community. And uh, not only as a physician, but as an educator. There's a lot of physicians out there that are influenced by you that are continuing your legacy. So, so thank you. Um, I, I don't know how to, it's, co it's complicated, right? Um, uh, we saw what happened in Idaho, we, we saw some of that happening in Texas in, in terms of rationing care. Um, going back to our belief that we collaborate with anyone but rely on no one <coughs> is why we added as many beds as we added. So not only did we add the 81 beds, um, we added more cardiac beds, we improved psychiatric beds, because we thought that would come with it. And um, we, I think at one point, had more than 350 traveling nurses, enormously expensive, um, and it creates a little bit of a sense of fairness, so you've got to put premium pay for your staff too. And so our highest numbers were during Delta. I think we hit a peak of 187 patients. The blessing, if there's a blessing to having, maybe being a near epicenter of Delta, was we were the only region hit hard at that moment. So I remember the decision, our key team got together and said, do we take care of all these patients? Um, and maybe they sit in our ER for 36 hours waiting for a bed. And meanwhile, maybe there's a heart attack patient waiting for a bed. Or do we begin to make a tough, but I think ethical decision to send patients to Kansas City or Columbia, which had very low numbers. We made that decision. And I stand 
buy it. It was the right thing to do. It was the right thing for our bottom line, maybe. But so we were very lucky that in the Delta surge, we had resources all around us. Um, we continue to have extra nurses throughout that were very helpful. So I, I believe rarely did our physicians find themselves in that position. Um, we did have patients that were boarding the ER, waiting for a bed, but our ER um, could care for them. But what, what the consequence of that was, our ER got backed up because our beds were being filled with those patients. So I don't think we have that same kind of experience that you've heard about in other areas, but I think it's because our, our medical staff, we brought in extra doctors, we brought in extra people, and so I think we didn't have that as bad as the places. I'm sure there's some examples where there's some kind of tough decisions. More likely, people who deferred care um, because we were so busy and maybe their illness got more acute. That's what I'm more worried about. And, and right now, I, I couldn't advocate more for health screenings and cancer screenings right now because those numbers are down and people are acquiring those diseases and aren't getting better. So tough, tough situation, but I think for the most part, we're uh, we did not have that problem. All right. Thank you for coming tonight. Let's, uh, let's give you a <laughs> So I, I've got a new faith.